I'm trying something a little different. Actually, I'm um, I'm recording from my bed instead of um, from the desk, which I haven't done since um, Shane and I and Carrie did the uh, the Gremlins episode. <laughs> Is that popsicle really weighing you down? Uh, oh man, I, I honestly I think I'm gonna live tweet every fucking popsicle I eat for the rest of the summer. I I love them so <laughs> much, dude. <laughs> Big into the coconut popsicles right now. It's so good, man. We need them. If you, if we don't, if what, how the fuck would we have gotten through uh, this quarantine without sweet treats, sweets and treats and creams and sugars and stuff like that? How else would we have done it? Especially cool ones. I feel like um, emotions are running high, and people might need something to yep. take their temperature down a little bit. Absolutely. I want to yep. get. Um, I haven't seen them, but people keep suggesting them to me, and they sound really good. I want to get. I, like, I've been getting like those those Mexican fruit, like crushed fruit or whatever popsicles. They got like coconut and they got mango and stuff. But people keep telling me there's a rice one that like tastes like a fucking like horchata a horchata popsicle. And I really want to try oh, it. Yeah, it sounds, oh, that sounds good. Doesn't that sound incredible, buddy? I know what my summer is going to look like for the rest of it. <laughs> or chata popsicles. Now we need these sweet treats to uh, I, keep I us going. I really appreciate you saying that how critical the sweet treats are. After in confidence before we started recording, I told you I was just starting a diet. <laughs> Shit, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, re- it's, I really appreciate it. It makes me feel great. <laughs> and then, and then before that, uh, how he looked like Sean Penn. <laughs> <laughs> a dollar store Sean Penn. Do- dollar store Sean Penn. <laughs> Which is true, by the way, I should point out. He's not being uh, self aggrandizing. He does, no. he does actually look like Sean I, 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 I consider that not a good thing, but. Or do you, he's, he's like, wasn't he like a. He was a handsome guy. He wasn't guy. a heartthrob, but he was a handsome guy, yeah. It was mostly in the smoldering, I think. <laughs> the kind of smoldering gazes. I'm seeing, I'm seeing more of a, I'm seeing more of a Chris Penn. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At this good. point in the quarantine, yeah. it's accurate. That <laughs> That's pretty yeah. good. Oh, shit, I don't feel good. Yeah, somebody tweet. I tweeted the thing today where Nancy Pelosi said oh, God. that she yearns for a Republican president. Mm-hmm. As do I. And um... well, she's about to get one. <laughs> yeah, she is. <laughs> so she doesn't no have to. No matter what, she's about to get she one. Not to worry about that. <laughs> it, no matter what happens, she'll get one. <laughs> <laughs> who is it that tweeted? I don't remember who it was. Was it Marge or something like that? That was like, and this is coming from somebody who has experienced the following Republican presidents while she's worked in Congress: Reagan, Bush, and then Bush. Right. And that's who oh, she's well, yearning I mean, for. Dude, they, you know, they love, they love Reagan. They love the first Bush, and they're fucking starting to warm up to um, the second Bush. Mm-hmm. Well, you guys are being unfair. She's clearly talking about Lincoln. <laughs> 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 what I've been thinking a lot about because there's so many of these like wacko QAnon guys, you know, QAnon people running running right now there's like several of them and it seems odd because it seems like like this kind of like very hard like extreme right reactionary turn seems like the kind of thing that like doesn't happen usually like when their guys in the white house you know what i'm saying like just imagine like if biden does right. win like what we're gonna see in like the 2022 midterms like oh like what the benghazi uh hearings are gonna be but for the democrat yeah like what like imagine like yeah imagine like what you know what that's gonna look like you know like the tea party wave in 2010 like imagine what like the, the first midterm election of a Biden administration is going to look like. Like if we're already getting QAnon people running like when they're guys in in the, in the White House. I mean, I even farther back. Like, the, do you guys remember the MAGA bomber? Of course. That um that that happened when uh when I was teaching um and I, incidentally I was teaching a class of propaganda and so we like talked about it in in class and I you know I was observing and I thought it was interesting at least to my knowledge in modern American history I don't know maybe in other places that it was the first time that it was an attempted terrorist attack in support yeah. of the sitting government yeah <laughs> like which is just so fucking mind-blowing right. in a certain way right yeah, like of course like because it wasn't even it wasn't even somebody who was like further right and wanted to like push things further right or whatever it was like literally i believe in my president so i'm going to do terrorism against his political enemies which is just um you know pretty pretty astounding stuff well i think i think about that sort of thing with like QAnon in general because like when you think about conspiracy theory like conspiracy theory is usually like you know I mean that's for like for people who have a, you know a lack of agency or a lack of like you know locus of control or whatever or like the people that downtrodden the people who have no right, power right. you know what I'm saying like it, you don't see usually see conspiracy theory like develop like this like when they're in power like they have like they have the power you know what I'm saying I think that you do sometimes see like elite conspiracy theories but the thing about QAnon is that it's not necessarily elite driven I mean now it's being adopted by people who are tr- 
trying to get into those like chambers of power and stuff. But I think, yeah, like to your point, it it, it started off at least as more of like a quasi grassroots, like bottom up of course, yeah. conspiracy. Yeah. And that's and that's the thing that is really um, unique in terms of like, yeah, like you're saying, because bottom up type conspiracies often are, you know, from people who are outside of the halls of power or whatever. Right. Or their perceptions. Right. It's yeah. Or like, yeah, I mean, you know, because so much of conspiracy theory is rooted in, you know, there's like like CIA conspiracy theories or like Illuminati conspiracy theories or, or whatever it may be, anti-government conspiracy theories that develop out of this like, you know, lack of having power and knowing you don't have that power and trying to make sense of it or trying to, you know, come up with a narrative that makes sense for why things are the way they are. But like QAnon, on the other hand, like like their guy is in power. You know what I'm saying? Like they got right. what they want. They're, they won. Their guy won. Their guy got elected and yet they still have to develop this weird conspiracy theory narrative about it i think you see there's a lot of figures um and i think that's why you see jfk conspiracy theories which is that people want it need a process that someone doesn't come through with what they perceive their promises to have been and then you have to say well why is that and it's like oh this thing's preventing him from doing it so right, right. In jfk's case it was a bullet um in the case of trump oh i guess they would say it's like the pedo state or i don't know i'm not familiar with the but you know Sickos. something's blocking him from, something's blocking him from doing all these wonderful right, yeah. things that that we knew that we supported him for um, right right so i don't know it seems sort of natural and i can see why trump is playing into it because then you know they kind of it seems like he sort of winks at a lot of these things um and and i would imagine that's signaling to his base like oh yeah i am just about to do all these great things it's just we need to you know have all the big arrests and that's coming right. soon but i've been i've been thinking a lot and i did a post about it yesterday i was joking about um like imagine like once we have like a whole QAnon wing of like a QAnon caucus in congress and then like <laughs> pelosi is still gonna like negotiate with them and compromise and like reach across the aisle. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. you can execute John Legend, but you can't execute Chrissy Teigen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Like, well, well, yeah, it'll be well, like we got we got some more mattresses. We have yeah. some more um, of those like tin foil uh, b- bedding that they put in the ice facilities. Uh-huh. And in, ex- in exchange for that, just for th- for the low low price of like um, two hundred million dollars for the like adrenochrome, the house adrenochrome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna send Tony Podesta to Guantanamo Bay, but not John. <laughs> The fact, you know, the fact that everyone's disappointed knows that you made a good compromise. (laughs) Yeah, in in 10 years when the president is just like a masked anonymous Q person, just wearing like a Guy Fawkes mask. mask. And it's just... Pelosi's going to look back and be like, I miss a a Republican presidency like like Trump. (laughs) What do you say, uh, if in interest of time, should we get in, start to get into the material? Hello there. I am Elon Musk, CEO and chairman of Tesla Electric Motor Vehicles. My marketing team told me that I've gotten off to a bit of a, I don't know how you would say, a rocky start with appearances recently. I have taken the internet by storm by various uh, cool, very hip uh, Twitter interactions uh, where uh, 13-year-old boys in Tesla shirts will send me cool memes of shows like The Fairly Odd Parents, and it will be a very cool joke uh, about, you know, like Grand Theft Auto, and um, uh, I, do, I do not know the little boy's name, the one with, with the tooth deformity, the one who, ba- back in South Africa, we would have just put him down. Well, he's ringing him out for content, and I see this hilarious meme from this little boy who, who uh, you know, will never be able to afford one of my Model S's, and I, I take his meme and I post it. With little outreach programs like this, I believe that me, Elon Musk, CEO and chairman of Tesla Motor Vehicles, firmly believe that this is me giving back to my community. I figured now is as good of a time as any to humanize myself. I have often been described as a robot or a reanimated corpse of a vacuum salesman from 1951 cursed to stay alive by a bog witch that my grandfather had aggravated as he was settling this land. So come with me. Let's check out the Tesla showroom. Over here is the most popular car in all of Tesla, which is the Model S. When we originally released this car, we promised a tax exemption for a portion of the car's cost. 
we factored this into overall savings, but forgot to tell you that the tires of the Tesla more than accounted for the gasoline that you would, uh, in theory, be saving. So uh, to make up for this slight oversight, we decided to make the Tesla truck. The Tesla truck is very hip, it's very cool, it's got so many edges. It looks like a car from a video game from 1973. I know that I showcased, you know, a bit of a window malfunction, but my internal team has informed me that it was actually done by Rogue Rick and Morty haters. To elaborate on this, I decided to bring in one of my uh, beloved engineers, uh, someone that I've recently... Uh, a louder, longer leash on, if, uh, as a figure of speech, sorry, I'm new to this land, I only immigrated here in 1994. Oh, oh sorry, just, just a second, the director's asking me a question. Yeah? Why did I leave South Africa in 1994? Was anything going on in South Africa around the year 1994? Bringing out my engineer, I, uh, his name is David. Uh, my name's Jeremy. David, could you tell them a little bit about how cool the Tesla truck actually is, and how it was sabotaged by a sleeper cell of Antifa agents? Sir, these chains are really starting to hurt my wrists. Go, go, no, please, don't, please, I'll do anything, just let me go. Well, that seems to be about all the time that we have here at Tesla Motor Vehicles. This is me, Elon Musk, CEO and Chairman of Tesla Motor Vehicles. Thank you for joining me and have an epic day. Welcome back, everyone, to Eat the Rich. This is a show about our political economy, late-stage capitalism, and the millionaires, billionaires, and multinational corporations hell-bent on staving off his death rattle. I'm Dwight, and today we have with us Shane. Hello. We have Chris. Howdy, folks. And welcoming back to the program for his second appearance, the DC correspondent for The Nation, Ken Klippenstein. Welcome. Hey, folks. What an honor to have you back. Um, and it's it's actually not a mistake that you're here today because uh, this last uh, last week was a little bit weird, uh, specifically, I think, in your world, Ken, with a certain seventh richest man in the world, Elon <laughs> Musk. It got a little funky. And uh, so we wanted we, 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 people have been asking for us to do an Elon Musk episode for a long time, and we wanted to wait for some impetus to do it, some sort of like boneheaded thing that he said. 20 of those things have happened since then, <laughs> to yeah, be fucking yeah. clear. Yeah. I, 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 and, and obviously, we'll never, never hit them all. But, uh, you know, definitely when something, when they, when somebody starts to mess with fucking Ken, I mean, that's a problem. We have to address <laughs> this. We must protect Ken at all costs. Eat the Rich, also known as the Ken Klippenstein Defense Squadron, will, will come in and defend. Second Battalion Ken <laughs> Defense Militia, <laughs> Upper Peninsula Militia, we're here. The anti boring company so <laughs> <laughs> So before we get into that, I think, uh, Shane, I want to turn it over to you so we can learn a little bit. Of, just do a quick little primer about Elon Musk. Because, again, we know a lot about him, but do we know a lot about him? <laughs> Elon Musk. A rhetorical what, flourish. Wh what do we know? Who, who is he? 
When did we know it? Um, yeah, I mean, before I start, I, I think uh, I'll say one of the reasons why, like you were saying, Dwight, that we um we haven't done a Musk episode yet is that, like, it, it is, like, it's the gift that keeps on giving in terms of awful rich people, right? Like, he he's always in the public eye now, and, um, like, you know, he's gonna continue to be shitty. And so, you know, even with the uh, material that we cover in this program is not even gonna be comprehensive in terms of everything in his life, and, and certainly the Will be more to come and so you know at any further point i guess we'll just end up having to do a follow-up or something or just invite him on for an interview a friendly joe rogan-esque interview <laughs> 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 but yeah, uh, so talking about his early life, he was born in 1971 in Pretoria, South Africa. Um, he grew up in a wealthy white family there uh, during the era of apartheid, which I'm sure as many people who listen are familiar with, was the racist, colonialist, segregationist policy employed by, you know, the British colonial overseers in South Africa. Throughout the 20th century, the population of South Africa, approximately like 10 to 20 percent of the population were, were white, you know, European, mostly British, um, and and, and, you know, Dutch. And uh, and then the rest of the population, you know, the vast majority of it, about 70 to 80% were black Africans. And so, you know, the policy wasn't just about like separation. It was a, poly, you know, a whole system of privilege, which obviously then maps onto class. And, you know, this isn't an episode about apartheid. Like, there might be a, a later episode where we can go into more detail about it. Um, I know that's something like Dwight <laughs> it would definitely be. It would, I'm just like love to talk about. Yeah. seething. Um, I mean, it's awful. It's evil. It's horrible. I mean, you know all that. The point of, like, highlighting it here is, like, talking about his upbringing and, and highlighting this element of it throws a wrench into the self-made man entrepreneurial nonsense that shrouds like his biography and we've talked about this a lot on the show with a variety of different you know rich characters who like all have this you know i was covered in dust as a child and i <laughs> rose from you know literal ashes to to you know, carry water up a hill or whatever and all of this nonsense and it's just like not the case right uh you know he the the reality is he was born into a family of uh you know immense wealth and immense privilege um in this like highly like fucked up uh, colonial situation in South Africa. Um, and so that leads you into talking about his family. And so I wanted to talk about his dad a little bit, Errol Musk. So Errol Musk was born in 1946, also in Pretoria. It's hard to find a lot of like exact details about his life. And partially that seems to be because he deliberately obfuscated a lot of that. That's something obviously, again, we've talked about on the show, like wealth can afford you. <laughs> like you can like cover your tracks and, you know, shroud your life in mystery. Um, but from what I can gather uh, is that Errol Musk, uh, made a lot of money in his early life as an engineering consultant and as a real estate developer. And he boasted himself that he had become a millionaire by the age of 30, which was also the same time that he got married to Hay May Haldeman, a Canadian-born model. And shortly after that, they had their first son, Elon, and then their second son, Kimball, and daughter, Tosca. And the Musks, uh, the, the, those Musk children are all relatively close um, together, and, the, you know, they're all in, wrapped up in, you know, Elon Musk's businesses and shit. Now, after... After they had a, a couple of kids, and after about nine years of marriage, Errol and May got divorced. And interestingly, a few years after that, Elon elected to live with his father rather than his mother. And he would have probably been around 10, 11 years old at this time. And the reason why I thought this choice was interesting is because Elon, at least today, like, hates right, his father. Right. Like, he absolutely hates his dad. He's, he's said, um, you know, a lot of, like, disparaging things ab ab about him in the press. I think at one point he even said he's, like, the worst person alive, or one of the worst people to live, which based on what I could tell is like probably true. Um, and you know, highlighting the fact that like he went to live with his dad, it's not to put it on him because from, again, everything I could read about Errol Musk, he seemed to be like an awful piece of shit, abusive guy wrapped up in all kinds of weird, awful things. Um, and, you know, as a, as a little kid, it's like, honestly, some of it almost, some of the shit I was reading almost endeared me to Elon because it sounds like he had like a really dramatic kind of like upbringing um, and like sort of a family life. And so uh, what, what, what did it look like, right? Like, and so what was the kind of option then of like going to live with his dad? Maybe what were some of the reasons for doing that? 
And so, according to one, like, biographical video thing I watched, which I sent to you guys. I don't know if you guys got a chance to look at it. But it so was, like, weird. this really weird, so like, weird. one of these PR puff pieces made in last year's on, on YouTube about, like, you know, how cool and awesome Elon Musk is. It has a little bit of information about his early life. But apparently, like, eh, Musk was bullied a lot as a kid. Um, he was always bullied for being, like, the youngest and the smallest because of the, his birthday. Um, is in the middle of summer, so it was some weird thing where like he was born on the last day you could be you know admitted to that year of you know like kids or whatever so he was always like the youngest and the smallest and he always got his ass kicked and eventually he like tried to take like karate lessons so he could fight back so that was what was going on at school and then at home his dad like all the time was saying like you're an idiot you're a worthless piece of shit who will never amount to anything you know just obviously this like intense abusive uh situation and and you know tormenting for this young man now again like in terms of then, like, the wealth and privilege that, that he was born into, besides, like, this kind of, like, emotionally abusive situation he was in, like, what did that look like? And there's this one episode um, from some point in the 1980s, again, it's sort of unclear, that I think helps illustrate, like, Errol Musk's personality and the wealth and stuff that he had from his family. And so I'm just going to read a bit for here from this piece from Business Insider South Africa from 2018 by Philip DeWitt. And, uh, and, it, and it's, it's just a very, like, weird story that I think is just, like, to me at least, is shocking as, as like, look, you know, somebody who grew up, like, poor <laughs> to look at and be like, what the fuck, right? So, in the mid-1980s, Elon Musk's father, Errol, and a co-pilot were on their way to England to board a plane they hoped to sell when they landed there. They never made it to their destination. Instead, Errol returned to South Africa with a half share in a Zambian emerald mine, which would help to fund his family's lavish lifestyle of yachts, skiing holidays, holidays and expensive computers. Basically the story is I'll skip uh, some of the other details here is that they were like they were supposed to get like a holdover and somewhere where they were flying and there was a religious holiday so they couldn't do it and so they ran into this group of Italians and so I'm gonna return to uh, the article here they ran into a group of Italians who as it happened were in the market for an airplane Errol named his price and a deal was done so he went to this guy's prefab and he opened his safe and there was just stacks of money and he paid me out 80,000 pounds it was a huge amount of money he said this is Errol talking standing with the cat Cash in hand, Errol was made another offer he couldn't refuse. Would he like to buy half an emerald mine for half of his new riches? I said, oh, all right. <laughs> so I became a half owner of the mine, and we got emeralds for the next six years. It was a lucrative decision. Errol employed a cutter in Johannesburg and sold the stones wherever his travels as an engineer or family holidays took him. And on at least one occasion, his now famous son, Elon, also took his hand at dealing in the gems with peculiar results. <laughs> And what that's referring to is that, like, there's this early story. So this was, like, this would be in, like, Elon's teen years. So he's, like, 14, 15 years old. And and purportedly, because his dad had this emerald mine, he would, like, walk around with emeralds in his pocket. What? And, like, try to mm-hmm. sell them. I've heard this. And so he, he, like, went into a Tiffany store, you know, like, the diamond ring fucking jewelry store. And he, like, sold a couple of stones for a few thousand dollars. And then, like, Errol, his dad, then made them go back to the store a week later and they saw that the ring that now had the stone was being sold for like thirty thousand dollars and so errol was like this is an important lesson on like how retail works <laughs> so again what? like this is just a <laughs> paint as, as a small example of like this whole idea like i mean sure whatever he was obviously in an emotionally abusive situation and he was like picked on at school he was like a nerd by all other accounts he was always like you know he was like a whiz kid he wanted to uh, play on computers from a young age um the other fucking thing that it, i saw on a bunch of biographical stuff about him was like he was always reading and when he ran out of books to read he would like read the encyclopedia oh yeah which, very real and normal story <laughs> which is like that's like to me i get it like not to be mean but that's like what like a dumb guy thinks like you should do to read you know <laughs> like i'm gonna read the dictionary or whatever i don't know it, it's it's just it's like a weird thing to like be proud of that you did as a kid i used to like reading encyclopedias when i was a kid mostly mostly i mostly i did too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what it is? This is like, it's like when a monster energy hat guy is like, he decides to play, he plays like Vivaldi or something. Right, to, right, right. 
exactly. Do you know what I mean? He's <laughs> right, right. It's, it, it's not like, I mean, it's not to say anything, there's anything wrong with reading the encyclopedia. I mean, shit, as a kid, I was like reading Wikipedia all the time. But it's as, as a way to like boast your intellect, to be like, I was reading the dictionary or I was reading the encyclopedia. Oh, so he's, so he's, okay, so he's recounted this story in a way that's boastful, is what you're saying. Oh, okay, yeah, fuck yeah, major nerd alert. Yes, like that. the whole idea is like, I took I took all of my spare time as a kid to like read, right? Yeah, that's a dumb, that's a dumb guy's brag. But yeah. the reality is like whether or not that was true, you know, it's like when did you read the encyclopedia in between like dealing diamonds under the table and gemstones exactly. that your dad had? Like the idea that like he, you know, he didn't have any like at that age already, he made a cool $2,000 just by having some shit that he had in his pocket, which is like a huge amount to make. Now you now you laugh. Now you laugh, but I mean, I, you know, I I certainly remember when I was a child and I stole a, a handful of jewels, valuable jewels from my father's <laughs> mine that were worth tens of thousands of dollars. And, you know, he simply used that as a, a casual way to teach me a lesson about retail. I mean, I, yeah. I remember that. We're, we're, yeah, this you, is like, it's like a Bill Dunk sermon or what, uh, the coming of age yeah, of course, story. Yeah. <laughs> Where you get you get a conflict you get a conflict diamond and then you, you, know, you, you kind of learn how business yeah. works. Do, everybody, you, I got you guys don't know this because you're not worldly. Because in the United States we have like lemonade stands as kids, but in mm. South Africa you become precious gemstone merchants. <laughs> right, exactly. at a young age. I remember my first. Right. I remember my first. My first blood diamond stand. You know, only like twenty percent of Americans have passports, guys. And I'm just saying, <laughs> you should get out there. I mean, one of the reasons I also wanted to bring up the Emerald Mine thing is because that that article that I just read had, like, a, you know, testimony and interview with his father, Errol, confirming that he owned an Emerald Mine. And why I thought that was important to bring up is that this story of him, his dad owning an Emerald Mine and making, like, tons of money off of it and, and using that to, you know, spend lavishly with the family, make sure that they had stuff, make sure they had, like, early access to computers and live, like, a luxurious life, is this is a particular thing that Elon Musk just like straight up denies. In <laughs> fact, uh, not too long ago, about seven months ago on Twitter, he got into a fight with like some other random person and, and who was saying like, oh, you know, Elon Musk, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His dad owned an emerald mine. And Elon Musk responded on Twitter. He didn't own an emerald mine. And I worked my way through college, ending up $100,000 in student debt. And then, you know, more bullshit. But he's basically like, this is like one of these things like, again, and we'll get to this eventually of his like contentiousness on Twitter, he's like very angrily like just defending this non-existent truth about himself that he didn't grow up with this. What fuck? How how do you run up a hundred thousand dollars of student debt in Canada? <laughs> Didn't he go to fucking like school thirty in years ago? Thirty years ago too, right? <laughs> right. Yes. 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 Like, yes. like in nineteen eighty nine, he <laughs> yes, he racked yes. up fucking a hundred grand worth of debt. Yeah. He was reading too many encyclopedias. <laughs> <laughs> Those was, things will run you, you know. He was paying for them. I, I went into the bookstore and I, I bought all the books uh, and I put it on credits. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a banana. It's oh. a banana, Michael. What could it cost? A hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what this is. These billionaires. That's what's so fascinating about this character is I think that a lot of the shock that people have at it is just that we're getting a window into how these people who are profoundly um, separated from, from ordinary people right. live. I suspect there are a lot more people like him uh, at his sort of uh, demographic, like income level than, than than one might think. It's just that they have PR, uh, a bubble. They're encased in a cocoon of like PR people right, and, right. and image image consultants and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's super weird. And, and I do want to get into... Um, um, like uh, you know, eventually, like to how how he you know created the 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 conditions for that he was then able to leverage into becoming this like public persona that's just like a thorn in our constant side. And again, um, again, his, his you know much like bragging about reading the encyclopedia is like a dumb guy's idea of what a smart person would do. Elon Musk and his public persona is the dumb guy's version of a genius. Right, right, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, he is like I've I've posted you know screenshots of this guy before. This uh, this is a a friend of mine, or not even a friend of mine, a, a guy I knew from Virginia that every time I log on to Facebook nowadays, he's got like some different posts. He's like, oh man, Elon Musk. He's just like, man, I'm convinced he's an alien just like sent here to save us from ourselves. Like, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, every time I log on, God. he's got a new one of those. I just, oh, it's insufferable. I wish yeah. he was a fucking alien so we could put a return label on that. So he's, just, he's just here to just, <laughs> you know, to get us safely off this rock, man. Like, imagine <laughs> believing that, that he cares about fucking 
if he could safely get anybody off this rocket, he would do that and not just fucking let you die. As if Elon Musk wouldn't like harvest that dude's kidney stones <laughs> for two dollars. Literally, <laughs> for and throw him in a river. Bulldoze his house if it fucking sh- shaved fucking five minutes off his fucking boring company tunnel to commute yeah. to commute to work every day. Uh, th- there's no eminent domain if you go under underground. I, I do want to before <laughs> before before we go too far into um into Elon. I do want to just quickly wrap up this stuff with his dad because there's uh, two other points that I think are interesting again to paint the the sort of picture of like what his upbringing was like and and you know who are like the major influences on his life um and and sort of again what it's like to be in the family of uh, wealth and privilege what that looks like. So here's an article that incidentally came out today or no last last month. This is the one that uh, you shared with me Dwight, the one that's just called Everything to Know About Errol Musk, Elon's Brilliant Terrible Father from Inside Hook. And so it's like a bunch of sort of like myth busty things and the first one talks about like the the emerald mine stuff. Um the next one there are all these like bullet points here. So I'll I'll just read it and it kind of automatically tells you what you need to know. Did he murder someone in South Africa? <laughs> Um, and so the article says here, according to Vance's book, uh, I think that's a, bi- a biography on, on Elon, Errol Musk's family has lived in South Africa so long that they claim an entry in Pretoria's first phone book. Musk is not reticent about his allegiances either, telling the Mail on Sunday, quote, I refuse to live in the U.S. I tried it and I came back home, even though he says his home country has more, quote, violent crime. Interesting uh, way to put what is most certainly a uh, racist dog whistle there. In both the Mail and a 2017 pro profile of Elon in Rolling Stone, Errol confirmed that he has been involved with the murder itself. According to the Elder Musk, he shot and killed three people who broke into his house in Johannesburg, a crime for which he was reportedly charged with manslaughter, but eventually acquitted on the basis of self-defense. What? So he did uh, kill three people. Um, whoa, whoa, so he's like, whoa. this is like a Chris Kyle thing where he's like bragging about gunning down people in, what was it, <laughs> Katrina, but he didn't actually do it. But in this case, it actually happened. Right, right. Yes, yes. Like, uh, <laughs> oh you know, God. and he takes that as a point of pride. The next, the next bullet point here, and this is great. Um, did he father a child with his stepdaughter? This is Errol. This is Errol. Um, yes, Musk. this is Errol Flynn, uh, Elon Musk's father. Errol Musk. <laughs> in, in the interview with Mail on Sunday, Errol admits that he's a philanderer, saying, I had a very pretty wife, but there were always prettier, younger girls. I really loved May, but I screwed up. That became <laughs> oh the understatement God. of the century when, in March of 2018, UK newspaper The Times reported that Musk fathered a child with his stepdaughter, Jana Bezoindhout, in a move reminiscent of Woody Allen. When the story broke, Musk was 72 years old and Bezoidenhout was just 30. As Mail Online wrote in 2018, Errol described the pregnancy as an accident, but said both Jana and their son were living with him, though they weren't in a relationship. Wait, so does that mean, so then she would be Musk's stepmother and his sister at the same time? Stepsister? No, oh. I, yeah, yeah, stepmother and, and, oh. uh... Oh. Stepsister, right? Oh, that's twisted. Yeah, yeah. I think it is that, and you're just like, you, it's so insane, you're like, that can't be right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's... it's, going it's through- it's just so horrible. And I mean, this is also like evidence like that, that particular episode, as you can tell, you know, that happened um, relatively recently, only a few years ago. This is another thing that like, um, you know, uh, Elon himself has like talked about, like, you know, hating his dad and, and you know, being really like embarrassed about him. And, and you know, f- so this, you know, Elon himself is like condemned this or whatever. So it's not to say, you know, that he's necessarily yeah. involved in this. It's just it just does show that like, obviously, his father was this like horrible piece of shit. And, you know, and, and in some ways that that may, you know, that was like abusive and awful to Elon, but that probably also rubbed off in a number of ways that I'm sure Elon Musk himself is like very uncomfortable with. I mean, not to get too much into it, but Elon himself has been uh, uh, accused of and seems very plausible that he, you know, it was domestically abusive with, with his interpersonal relationships. Yeah. You know, so... I take it, take it as you will. So anyway, so he grows up, uh, you know, with this awful, like, horrible man as his father, and eventually he leaves South Africa after he graduates high school. Right as you mentioned, he goes to uh, to Canada to start, you know, his uh, college degree. Uh, he eventually switches schools and goes to University of Pennsylvania. Hey, shout out! Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he finishes his education there at the Wharton School of Business. Interestingly, as does uh, I did uh, everybody in the Trump family. And so then after that, there, there seems to be a few years of him, like, sort of figuring out what he's going to do, and this is now in, like, the mid-90s, and he moves out to California because he gets a he gets accepted into a PhD program for computers, and, and like, an, as another point of pride that he takes, he dropped out on day two of the PhD <sighs> program to, like, start a company. 
And and again, this is like one of those weird, uh, you know, self-starter kind of thing. This it's not the only person in the Silicon Valley, you know, industry who has done that. I mean, it's, there's a lot of the same mythos around like Facebook and Google. You know, the whole idea of like, oh, we, you know, we were kind of in college for a little bit, but I, I purportedly, even in his undergrad degree, Elon Musk, in one of the interviews I saw, he said, um, you know, he didn't really go to class. The thing that he really got out of college is that he was able to date girls his own age, and that was his words. What the fuck does that and even mean? Who the fuck knows what that <laughs> means? Uh, why would he need to about, point that out? That's odd, yeah. Yep. A little bit suspect, a little bit fucking weird. Jesus Christ. Um, so anyway, he leaves, uh, you know, he leaves uh, the PhD program that he was going to do. Uh, it was at Stanford. That was where it was. He leaves that to found his first company, which is Zip2, um, which is kind of what gets him in on the ground floor. It was an idea, early internet company to basically provide a, um, like a phone book online, like a phone book directory thing online. And, you know, he talks about it being a point of pride. I believe he started that one with his brother, Kim. Kimball, and there's this whole thing of like right. they lived in a horrible apartment where Elon couldn't even shower like they didn't have a bathroom in the apartment so he had to like shower at the gym just like all of this kind of like weirdly implausible stuff and so he you know he started this company and it was it ended up being successful and it got bought out and that's where he made his first big chunk of money he made I think the company was sold for like 20 million dollars not bad coin or no the company the company was sold for maybe more but but Elon's share of that was about 20 million dollars and so at this point in his own, like, according to his own biography, like, he, you know, in him talking about it, you know, he was like in his, what, he was in his mid to late 20s, and he was now like a fucking uber millionaire um, living in California, and he said, like, I could have just bought a private island and be, been sipping Mai Tais, but instead I decided to, you know, save it was the really world. important, I gotta save the world, and the way you save the world is you create a new internet company that's about, like, exchanging money on, on the internet, so he he founded x.com which was a money early money exchange thing that was in 99 and then that eventually merged with the company that owned paypal and then he turned the whole thing into paypal and uh he was eventually like ousted as ceo but then the, the company got sold and he made another huge chunk of change uh again the company was sold for like a billion and a half to ebay and elon made 10 percent of that so like about a hundred million dollars probably a little bit more jesus christ and so again he he that was kind of the, the pattern in his life and, and seems to have been, you know, start a company or in this case, sort of like acquire a sort of smaller company that gets bought out. And then you take that money and you leverage it and you go even bigger the next time. Um, and so the next project then was SpaceX, which he founded in 2001. And then after, you know, he, he obviously still has held on to SpaceX. Then there was Tesla. Interestingly, Tesla was an acquisition that he made um, where he edged out the guy who had actually fucking founded the company and then just like turned him himself into the main product designer of Tesla. So again, this wrench in the idea that he was somehow the entrepreneur who came up with the idea. He didn't. He basically took it over and took somebody else's idea um, and then kicked that guy out of the company. This is sort of, um, this is reminiscent of, of the, the sort of the, the John Delaney path to wealth of like acquiring yes. sort of what he did was acquiring these various I believe they were like um, firms that sold like um, medical equipment and medical parts and stuff like that and um, he'd you know, acquire a smaller one and um, you know, then flip it and then do the same thing and going sort of bigger and bigger and bigger and howard schultz too he did not start starbucks right he just you just buy it right right exactly you you leverage your way into these things uh, another one of his projects that um that isn't heard about as much because you know it, all of his projects are can be argued are failures i i would <laughs> but this one in particular is such a failure that i barely even heard of it he, he started a solar panel company called solar city in 2006 oh, i actually didn't realize that was him and according to his, again his own biography he went to burning man and he had like a revelation in the <laughs> mid 2000s that we needed to get off uh, fossil fuel and uh, and part of his meta business model the way he put it was that you know solar city is about energy production like clean energy production and then tesla is about clean energy consumption ah see i could corner the whole market on the whole thing so there was a there was a there was a period there was a period of time where i sold i think i mentioned this before i sold solar panels for, right. yeah, for a company called Sol nice. solar time and um i knew several people at the time this would have been i guess 2010 2011 i knew several people who um took jobs at solar city i think they even like transferred out to california to do it nice but i guess if that company was a failure I, i'm not sure how it turned out for them not well um yeah i mean look then the, the other the other company the more recent one is 
was the Boring Company, which is just so hilarious. And that, again, was started, again, by his own kind of story. Is like, he was sitting in traffic, and he was tweeting, and he was like, in 2016, he's like, I wish I could just dig a tunnel out of this traffic. <laughs> and, and that... Thus was born a company. It's a subway. Right. No, that's what I was going to say. I, I imagine him I imagine him riding the subway and being like, what if there was a way that we could make this less efficient? Like, what about this? Right. But instead of, you know, a train that, you know, costs a relatively low amount of money and can move a large number of people at one time, what if that, but just one rich asshole at a time? It's, right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a rich person subway. Right. It's a separate subway right. system. Right, <laughs> right. It's the, it's, <laughs> it's the fucking subway stupidest idea I, I i cannot believe anybody takes it seriously because it is on at face value it is the dumbest fucking idea i mean it's 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 tantamount to another one of his projects which i don't believe he made a company for he, he might have or maybe it's now just like a subsidiary or something else but his idea of the hyperloop <laughs> he also threw that out there again i mean look the the reason why like we know a lot of the the these stories i mean if you've paid attention to the the, the news in the, you know the last like decade or so you've you've heard of him you've seen as many ridiculous pr stuff and stuff and so I you know some of the details about this to me aren't as super important to go over but the reason why I wanted to like just kind of quickly go through that progression is uh two twofold the first the first thing is there's this uh term that I like I forget if I brought it up on the show before but it's a term by this um technology writer and sort of critic Evgeny Morozov called technological solutionism and the idea is it's an approach it's sort of almost like an ideological approach to the world that in his view is like infects like the whole kind of Silicon Valley you know, tech industry logic, which is that technological solutionism basically like looks at some issue in the world, right? And immediately reduces it into this like puzzle. Like, like it takes something that is probably like incredibly complex and layered, reduces it into this like simple puzzle, like, and then approaches it from this engineering standpoint of like, how can we make this more efficient? Then it does that. And regardless of whether or not that has solved whatever the issue was, because it usually it doesn't, it just kind of either shifts the issue, you know, the idea of like, oh, we're going to break, you know, we're going to disrupt the X industry. And it's like, you haven't disrupted anything except you've just now transferred it. Instead of like hailing a cab, I get a cab on my phone. You know, it's not, it's not like a, <laughs> it hasn't dramatically transformed the, the relationship there. It's just shifted like who's making money off of it. But then what you do is you do, you do that and then you say, hey, we fixed the problem and then you walk walk away and you just move on to the next project and you say we've now solved that when in reality like the problem which is and maybe in this case like transportation or whatever is incredibly nuanced and complex and you haven't solved it and I, to me Elon Musk is just like the perfect avatar of this solutionist kind of mindset because he just he'll like start a company based on a whim based on his like poor reading or understanding or personal pr difficulty like again he was personally in traffic and so suddenly it occurred to him traffic is a problem how do we solve this we dig a giant tunnel underground then you just throw a bunch of money at a bunch of engineers you hope maybe they do something you do a big pr splash and then you just walk away from it and you say now nah, i've solved it and in this case you haven't even fucking built anything or made anything but because he does those stunts he's able to portray himself in a way and this is like the second reason why i wanted to go through all of this he's able to portray himself as you said chris as like the savior and he sees himself in this way he sees himself as like fucking you know some tony stark slash Henry Ford, you know, fucking industrial genius who's going to revolutionize the world and we're all going to be living on Mars and, I don't know, fucking digging tunnels to get more emeralds out of the fucking craters on, on the red planet or whatever the fuck it is. And because he portrays himself in this messianic way, he has this whole, like, cult and PR wing around him. And to me, that's his most successful project because if you look like look at, like, Tesla, since he acquired it, and it has, it has never had a profitable year. Every Every year it loses money. <laughs> And, and if you go if you go to their like site they they, they point out like we have had profitable quarters <laughs> like, but they haven't had profitable years and the whole idea is that like again it's the epitome of the Silicon Valley logic where it's just like you just throw money at something like this is part of the, this is the future this is the future this is the future and then you know eventually that's a bubble that's going to fucking burst or what you do is you start hemorrhaging your money from whatever it is your successful shit or your own personal wealth to keep the company afloat um, which is what I suspect he's must have done because he's, he's purportedly worth his net worth is 60 billion dollars and that's been going up i saw a thing that was in 2014 or 2015 that estimated his net worth
worth at $15 billion. So in, in about five years, he's quadrupled whatever that, that net worth is. And that all is based on like speculation and, and like the purported like stock price of these companies and stuff when they don't actually produce anything to make a profit. It's totally ass backwards. And then again, he portrays himself as the savior. And, and that's why he, he, he leans so hard into the PR stuff, right? And that's why he's so active on Twitter. That's why he gets into a fight with fucking Ken. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just because he has this sense about himself. That's why he doesn't shut up. That's why he doesn't listen to whatever handlers he has. Who's probably like, Elon, you know, you don't have to tweet today or whatever. Like, you know... <laughs> So I, I'm dying. I'm dying to hear the ins and outs, Ken, of what the fuck happened between you two. What does it feel like to get into a beef with the seventh richest man on earth? Um, it's it goes to your head because it's like this guy's worth what sixty yeah, sixty billion dollars, <laughs> and it's like I'm worth this person's time. It got to the point that I was like, okay, dude, I gotta go see my family because it's the Fourth of July and uh, <laughs> I have things to do. So I'm gonna have to rain check on this, have to rain check on this whole conflict thing, and come. And so the next day, then I jump back in and saw what his tweets were. But I was just thinking how um, surreal that is that like I have more responsibilities than um, than this person who you know, according to the sort of uh, market ideology, is 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 running sixty billion dollars worth of productivity and, and mm -hmm. responsibilities and things you're not worth 60 billion. i was under the impression that you would be our first billionaire guest yeah <laughs> if you ask my mom maybe she'd think that but oh I that's very sweet <laughs> maybe i'm sure a lot of our like listeners saw it but maybe you could run down like exactly sort of what happened so what happened was Ghislaine maxwell had been um arrested by the fbi and she was <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was, of course, splashed across all over the media. And so, you know, myself seeing that, something I'm always annoyed by is, uh, of course, how many people have been in photos with her or, you know, Epstein or whoever um, from that sort of orbit and how we just, the media collectively pretends like it didn't happen and it just all gets memory hold because um, these people are extraordinarily powerful and you don't really talk mm -hmm. about those things. So um, what I tweeted was just a picture of uh, the, the photo of him, which is a real photo of, it wasn't Photoshopped or anything, a lot of people were asking that, um, of uh, Musk next to, posing next to, uh, Glenn Maxwell, uh, Musk, of course, maintains that uh, he was photobombed. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. I don't think that's credit. I don't think that's um, I don't think that's believable. But um, I just tweeted the photo and said, "Oh, you know, it'd be a shame if uh, people sent this to Elon, and and so we can see like how he'd respond." And boy, did he! I, I mean, I didn't know if he would respond. I, I didn't think he would respond. But um, I did wasn't. you tag him? Like, do this too? No, I didn't. I d I think I just said I don't I don't remember. But I I can't remember. But I gotta say, Ken, we're a, we're a really big fan of that tactic here because. Uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob Michael Bloomberg, also another one with uh, a couple pictures of him and Ghislaine Maxwell. And um, when he was running, we um, yeah, we were very encouraging of our listeners to uh, to flood his replies with with those pictures, and they did. So every time he tweeted, Fuck, it worked. Huh? Yeah, there were. Uh... Wait, Mike Bloomberg was with her too. Yeah, yes. of course. Oh my God, she dude, everybody. She is like the she's like Carmen San Diego <laughs> of like child <laughs> child molestation. <laughs> She's everywhere. It's insane. I know. I know oh man. my god. Uh, anyway, so I tweeted it, and then um, it went wild. I don't remember. So many people. It was to the point that you could go to Elon Musk's Twitter and scroll down the replies, and it was just that photo <laughs> again, and again, like literally. It, it, it was maybe occasionally punctuated by some uh, adoring fan, but it was like overwhelmingly just that picture. <laughs> yeah, Elon, go on, go on, Joe Rogan again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and then uh, you know, I just thought that was sort of funny. I didn't really think anything would come of it. And next thing I know, my phone is like buzzing, and so I. Uh, check it and uh elon had replied to so, uh someone that, uh, or he didn't i don't think he sh called this was like a couple weeks ago so i'm trying to remember it I'm trying to remember the timeline but uh he ended up saying that there were there was like a botnet attack <laughs> and this felt very like 2016 2016 2017 uh, when oh every God. anyone who disagreed with anyone was a russian bot or you know whatever right it was. so he right. said it was a botnet and to, in its defense it did sort of look like that because there's so many people <laughs> sending it like I, but i i mean i hadn't seen anyone tell people to send it you know, prior to uh, my tweet, and uh, you know, I'd like to think that I have entire armies at my beck and call. But I, I think <laughs> people yeah. saw something in the saw something in the picture that that you know they felt. I think yeah, I think that's part of the popular fascination with this, which is that um, you know it's not fair that uh, these extraordinarily wealthy people are not uh, you know held to account for things that any ordinary person would be. So all these folks were uh, sending it to him, and then so yeah, he says the botnet thing, and then somebody else replies, it's like I think it was just this guy Ken Klippenstein, and he tags me. <laughs> He's like, I oh, yes, Ken Klippenstein, uh, journalist and. Er, 
vote what was it um pseudo journalist and douche about talent <laughs> which was interesting because it suggests that he I, I was kind of like oh you know who i am because <laughs> 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 i had made fun of him i had made fun of him before but i assumed he had handlers kind of running these things but apparently apparently he knew who i was um and so i guess he changed his mind about the botnet thing and then after that he ended up tweeting a this was like maybe three days had passed and people were still like every tweet of his was still just that photo so i guess that was getting to him so he ends up he ends up making this really kind of desperate entreaty to uh, on behalf of on behalf of internet freedoms or, or uh, decency <laughs> that, that that people that people would re- report the trolls and he doesn't really you know specifically say what what the trolls are he says they're they're clearly in um what is it uh, he, he tried to compare it to a uh DDoS attack what was happening right. <laughs> <laughs> which again like if you look through the replies like there were there were a lot of there were an overwhelming number of, I don't think it was taking Twitter I'm not um, uh, DJ Khaled where they're having to call up uh, <laughs> Apple computers to give me the most powerful server I don't think it was getting I don't think it was that bad but there were a lot of replies with that photo um, so he ends up saying you know on behalf of decency in the internet like we need to report uh, these these awful these awful trolls that are effectively doing a DDoS and uh, some people dug up I didn't know he had said this but he's been an anti like cancellation he's been critical of people getting canceled before so he said we need to cancel cancel culture people started tweeting this it's like well how does this square with you know that uh we need to report people who are being rude who i think are being rude to me you know and he never mm. he never responded to that Jesus. but um you know sort of cr- compressed uh you know uh four or five days or so of just I, and i would encourage people to go back to that time frame and just look at the replies it's quite funny and uh somebody you know i knew several a bunch of people reached out to me and said hey my tweet was you know blocked or deleted or something a reporter or something and so uh, i don't know if it was him or maybe he got all his fans to do it or what but a ton of people got reported based on that <laughs> so he, he did have some success i don't know if it's him just sort of like some caffeinated squirrel just going through every reply like report report report, <laughs> report. Like a bunch of people a bunch of people got reported oh, and, much, and, i mean and, much much like you he certainly has a, a legion of he has an army ready to uh to defend oh him. yeah yeah that's the thing he's a he's a sort of spiritual figure in a way that somebody perhaps like trump is not i have called him uh he's kind of like he's kind of like the moktada al say of like uh, Reddit libertarians, <laughs> where he's just commanding these like human, these like human these human wave attacks of like <laughs> of like uh, twi- t- uh, like t- ten follower Twitter accounts to like report their replies, blacking out. <laughs> but I mean, you alluded to this earlier. He offers this kind of hope, and I'm a little sympathetic to it because it's like you know, if you're just some rube that's like, gosh, climate's scary. I understand that, and uh, unfortunately, you know, I don't think a seventy thousand dollar car or however much it costs is, is really gonna put much of a dent in uh, emissions because how many people can afford that but uh, I, I i do think that's part of the part of the appeal um I, I get the impression there's a sort of like incel character there's definitely overwhelmingly male but uh mm-hmm. but also i think that in the more sympathetic side of things there is a a hope you know which is imbued in people from all of these you mentioned tony stark the marvel movies the idea that this benevolent uh rich guy batman or bruce wayne or whatever is going to come and save the day uh when you know unfortunately we, we all know uh, the only sort of r- response uh that, that can meet the challenge of climate is going to be the sort of collective response that only the government can mm-hmm. do but uh, right. unfortunately people may not r- realize that that's a that's a possibility or an option so you know maybe perhaps naturally they they, they look to uh entrepreneurs for uh hope or you know some some sense that someone's looking out for us mm-hmm. and i think the key there too can just to, to jump onto that when you you're like you're calling him an entrepreneur right is is really what he is he's not a genius but he plays the part of like uh, like again the, the with the tony stark example right like in the in that world, right, Tony Stark, like, builds the fucking shit. Like, he is actually a a scientist making that stuff. Elon Musk is not... He, you know, he, the ideas that come from him are the ones that cause the rockets to explode. He's not the one <laughs> shooting them into fucking space. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. You know, like that's how you reminded me that he said uh, Ken Goldman's end quote journalist, and I replied Elon Musk quote engineer, and then I put, yeah. put a picture of the <laughs> rocket blowing up. <laughs> you know, I that. But uh, I mean, there's a serious point there. Which is that, like, he's as much of an engineer or scientist as Trump is a businessman. Yeah. Right, you know what I mean? Right, like, right, exactly. There's a lot of similarities between them. And when you, you recounted his father's background, that was really uncanny. Uh, you know how similar it is to Fred Trump. To Trump. Sure, right, it yeah. It says a lot about the media because the media is responsible for, you know, millions of people believing that Trump is some sort of astute and uh, canny uh, businessman. And it's also the media that is responsible for, although a different media uh, with Trump is probably, you know, cable TV and, and uh, Apprentice. 
In the case of Musk, um, I think a hell of a lot of people think he's, uh, they have some vague idea that he's some sort of science genius or mad scientist or something or, you know, some, and you right. look at him and I think he has a bachelor's, I don't think, uh, if I remember, or maybe you said he dropped out of, you know, in, yeah. uh, not just that, when he watches interviews, he doesn't, my dad's a scientist and when I hear how he speaks and I hear how Musk speaks, Musk just does not sound, um, you know, like someone who's very serious about these sort of things. Right. Um, he has a kind of pop science, but, uh, you know, the, the media sort of credulously goes along with this stuff because um, uh, one of the reasons is that Musk has a network of Facebook accounts and I can't, I don't know a whole bunch of different ones and they can kind of artificially get these articles to blow up and, and drive a lot of traffic and so that at that point there's a you know there's a incentive on the part of the media just for clicks and then also I think there is value to uh, you know a certain uh, class of people to have 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 the uh, yeoman of the country of the United States just believe that billionaires are building all this great stuff and that they're right. geniuses and we don't need to levy taxes and fund the uh, DOE mm. you, you, you know so um, right. it, it played a major role in much it, a lot of parallels between him and Trump I think but I was, I was gonna say before before we um, I think we'd be remiss before we get too far from the topic if we didn't um, we talk a little bit more about uh, about the Epstein connection there because we're really not you know entirely familiar really not entirely sure yeah what, you know what that connection is I mean supposedly you know Business Insider reported that uh, that Epstein took a tour of the Tesla um, plant in in California back in 2012 which that would have been after he was already you know you know convicted and had been to jail the first time Jesus. Elon Musk denies that but I mean Business Insider reported it it's been it's been reported on yeah this is what frustrated me so much when when Musk came out and he said oh it's a photo bomb this is unfair and a lot of people started responding well you know just because he's next to somebody doesn't necessarily mean anything which is which you know, is um, fair yes in, in yeah. principle it right. doesn't yeah but de- but he's being so disingenuous right. and his defenders are being disingenuous when they say it because there's a web of associations of course here. yeah and again I'm not saying mm-hmm. that means he's the same as Epstein I don't know what the nature of the relationship is but the fact that there are you know multiple instances in which uh, you know their orbits overlapped at the very least so you just mentioned the private tour that uh, Business Insider reported that uh, he was given by Epstein and uh, Epstein's entourage of uh, SpaceX that was one yes uh, must denies it but then there's another case where um, and this was really extraordinary his ex-wife ended up giving a statement after um, everyone was replying with this stuff and, and, and he had his entreaty for everyone to lay off she ended up saying yes we went to a party of um, uh, we went to Epstein's mansion right. at one yeah. point and she says it's possible <laughs> I met Ghislaine I don't remember but um, you know this was just one of a bunch of different uh, sort of visits that, that we were making and it was really strange because the language is very stilted I have a lot of lawyer friends they all told me that it sounded as though uh, it was written by an attorney because they have all right. these right. you know they have all very uh, very tailored language like very stilted language like uh, appear to be uh, you know to the best I think she said to the best of my knowledge mm-hmm. which is Nobody literally what you that. say when you're being yeah <laughs> <laughs> you say that when you're being grilled by like the right. co-chairman of a committee, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like the Elliot Engel defense. Or I'm sorry, the um, who's that? Who's the guy with the uh, Nicaragua? Elliot uh, Abrams. Elliot Abrams defense. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you, you you do it when you're talking about what you did in Central America to Congress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there there was that, and then um, his brother had. This is really amazing. Business Insider also reported that his. This is in separate yes. report. Uh, that his brother had been set up with a girlfriend by. Yes, Epstein, this is what I was going to bring up. Yes. Yep, and this there's still more. There's, um, but wait, there's more. There, uh, there's the New York Times. There's the New York Times report, uh, and you know you can say whatever you want about Business Insider. I think they have serious reporters, but uh, in the case of the Times, you know this is a very kind of respected and the sort of I don't know, uh, you know, mainstream of the of the news media. Uh, this individual reported. It. Um, he reported that Epstein had told him that he had served as an advisor to Musk and helped him find what would be an executive board for when he was um, planning to take um, Tesla public. And this was, of course, prior to when um, you know he was told this prior to when um, Epstein died but when he when he passed away is when it was when it was reported which is just so interesting about this industry you know they'll start saying these things about a billionaire once he's passed away uh, you know part of that maybe is like l- legal things you know you have more space to say things um, but I think a- another one is just the fact that there's so many um, r- r- rich people that had been in proximity to this person that there was a sort of herd immunity where they all kind of um, circled the wagons and were like well if any one of us starts getting yelled at for these associations then then uh, <laughs> An injury to one is an injury to all billionaires, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and 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 so I, yeah, I, I do think.
think that there's, you know, a kind of uh, unseemly reasons for, for that this stuff is kind of not discussed, even though it exists in the periphery. We all know it, right? And we have these pictures that we all kind of see. It just doesn't get reported very much. What's weird, what what struck me as a weird um, similarity as well is that if I'm not mistaken, Jeffrey Epstein kind of built a completely unfounded, but built a reputation around himself as this like science guru sort of weird philosopher Same sort thing. of character. Very yeah. Similar, very similar story. Because mm. uh, when you look at him, he came out of the finance world uh, and, you know, he has all these, pre- he has this whole pretense of being some sort of math genius. But when you look at the evidence, it's pretty thin. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe he was, I'm not saying he wasn't good at math, but he certainly doesn't have any of the sort of, you, you know, accomplishments that you would think of someone uh, who's sort of formal, formally in that field. Oh, yeah. For, for some, I mean, for somebody who was supposedly, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, a math genius and a hedge fund manager for years. I mean, there's no, there's no evidence of that. Right. Mm. Oh. Right. He ends up, I mean, a lot of his money ends up coming from um, people that he endeared. And in the case of um, uh, Epstein, he made, you know, very close friends with Les right. Wexner, right. who was, you know, a multi billion an extraordinary billionaire. Oh. And uh, he ends up stealing from, uh, which he also did, um, you know, when he worked on Wall Street, uh, he ends up stealing a bunch of money from Wexner. And uh, for some reason, <laughs> uh, you guys can imagine, I, I mean, I don't, no one knows why, it's never been reported why, uh, Wexner never, pros- never, never went after right. him to try to get the money right. back. It's curious. Yeah. You know, let's just let bygones be bygones. And maybe billionaires are, yeah, you know, bi- famously generous billionaires who don't, <laughs> who are not, <laughs> who, who are not uh, controlling and, and, and uh, uh, worried about their property. Just, and on the topic of like the kind of faux expertise or like faux, uh, you know, scientific genius stuff that we're talking about, one of, one of the little details that quite tickled me um, when I was looking at uh, the origins of SpaceX, um, one of the first moves that Musk did when he found SpaceX, and again, that was like in his leapfrogging thing where he like took a bunch of money from his previous thing so he could start a new company. And he was like, okay, so we're going to start like from scratch, like how are we going to build this like new, you know, private rocket company? He went to Russia and this was in the early 2000s. So it was still in that period of like the post-Soviet uh, collapse and, and the recovery there. And, you know, the, uh, during the 90s, especially, you know, the Russian Federation and a lot of the other successor states were like selling off whatever assets they could for whatever money they could, um, you know, to, you know, Western investors or other capitalist interests and stuff. And so Musk went there with the intention of buying an ICBM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he and he says it himself, and I saw it in an interview. And he's like, "Yeah, like we went we went to Russia to buy an ICBM, uh, you know, uh, without the nuke, of course." <laughs> and he started laughing at that, like, and the way he says it, it's like, "Did you did you try to buy the fucking nuke <laughs> as well?" <laughs> but again, that shows that shows the idea was that like the reason he when and 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 the and the the beginning of like starting the rocket company was not like I have a fascination and a knowledge of rockets. I have people I know who are you know experts and right. and and rocketry that I think we could really p- pull together we could get a great team of engineers together it was literally like just like a rich guy thinking like oh i guess where could we buy rockets where's the cheapest place we could buy rockets oh let's go to russia and see if we could buy a decommissioned fucking you know human killer exactly. <laughs> but 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 i think it's also like an artful turn of phrase too like a very deliberate turn of phrase to say it that way because what it implies is hey this is something an icbm an intercontinental ballistic missile is something that's like so scary but when you get to be like me, it's just something that I can do as a matter of course. And it's right. I could buy one. Exactly. And and and, yeah. and and moreover, like it's totally within the realm of reason that I might be able to include a nuclear warhead on it as well. And right. that- yeah, this is like what Trump does. Do you remember when he was running in 2016? He'd be like, oh, yeah, I buy a lot of politicians. I, I control them. You know, I run them. <laughs> and it, people see this oh, as an geez. exercise of as a, as a sort of uh, uh, nonchalant exercise of power that they're supposed to be in, if you're impressed by that you know kind of thing then you're kind of like wow this guy's the big kahuna that he can do that exactly so like the weird like like you said the fucking weird libertarian redditors can be just like oh, dude, he, he didn't even want to buy the nuke but he like he could have though he's gonna in- do innovation to uh, come up with thorium x and then he <laughs> that's the that's the alternate the parallel universe that we can go down with. God. <laughs> So to to there's there's one uh, piece of this here that I really wanted to read, um, and and there, it includes a phrase that I looked at that I it really stuck with me, and I, I wanted to share it with everybody. Um, this is something that I read from the People's Dispatch. Uh, it's uh, it was written in March by Vijay Prashad and Alejandro Bejarano, and the title of it is this, and and the phrase is in the title, and I think once we get to the end of this article, you'll really understand why it stuck out for me so much. The title is Elon Musk is acting like a 
and Neo Conquistador for South America's Lithium. And the the uh, the subheading here is Vijay Prasad uh, and Alejandro Bejarano look at the scramble for Bolivia's lithium resources led by billionaire Elon Musk in the context of a coup d'etat. So as as you as you guys will remember, I mean there was an incredible change and shakeup in Bolivia's governance uh, last year, and I don't think it, once we read this and understand what was at stake, you know, there was a lot of kind of conspiracy theories at the time, like was the CIA involved? What was going on? You know, what was their uh, indigenous rights at, at odds with natural resource and and um, kind of like American and European conglomerates that are trying to get pieces of it? But let's let's get into this and and then we can dissect it. Elon Musk, the head of Tesla, who wants to build an electric car factory in Brazil, he said he was uh he he was supposed to meet Jair. Bolsonaro, the, pres- the president of Brazil, in Miami in early March, but he said he was too busy. Instead, Musk will go to Brazil sometime this year. All eyes are on the southern Brazilian state of Santa Catarina, whose Secretary of International Affairs, Darian Campos, is in direct contact with Musk. Interesting. Two automobile manufacturers, BMW and GM, already have factories in Santa Catarina. Marcos Pontes, the Minister of Science, Technology, Innovation, and Communications, held a video conference with Anderson Ricardo Pacheco, a senior Tesla official. They were joined by Daniel Fridas, a congressman, and Clayton Pacheco Galdino, who is the business development director for Criciúma, a city in Santa Catarina. They are eager for Tesla to open a gigafactory in South America's largest economy. Okay, there's a lot of characters in there, but long story short, they are goading Tesla to open up one of their famous gigafactories in the southernmost state of Brazil, Santa Catarina. It helps that Brazil has considerable lithium deposits, mostly in the southeastern states of... Blah, 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 and uh, But the, the production of lithium is limited, largely having been used for ceramics and glass production. The Bolsonaro government is interested in increasing the production of lithium as a key raw material for the lithium ion batteries that power electric cars such as those made by tesla but brazil's lithium will not be sufficient tesla would need to import lithium from elsewhere now this brings us to what they they dub here as the lithium triangle over 50 percent of the world's known lithium deposits are in the lithium triangle the lithium concentrated brine sources in argentina bolivia and chile in a bizarre tweet the bolivian entrepreneur samuel doria medina wrote that since Elon Musk and Jair Bolsonaro will discuss the Tesla plant in Brazil, they should add to this initiative the following. Build a gigafactory in the Salar de Uni. I should have looked up how to fucking say this. Iuni. In the Salar de Iuni to supply lithium batteries. Doria Medina is not just an entrepreneur. He is the vice presidential candidate along the interim president, Janine Añez, for the May 3rd, 2020 Bolivian presidential elections. Añez came to power only because of the coup d'etat against Evo Morales in December in, in November 2019. Doria Medina's welcome mat to Tesla should therefore be seen as having the full authority of the coup government behind it. Now, Morales, the since deposed leader of uh, Bolivia, Morales' government had been very cautious with these lithium reserves, and he's made clear that these resources were not to be turned over to transnational corporations in deals favorable to the firms. What gains come from lithium, uh, Morales had pointed out, must be properly shared with the Bolivian people. It was Morales' socialist policy towards Bolivia's resources that doomed his government. The oligarchy, which was angry with Morales' government and its socialism, used every mechanism to undermine the election of 2019. Forest fires in the northern and eastern regions of Bolivia provided the oligarchy's media with weaponry to suggest that Morales had abandoned his commitment to the environment and to Pachamama, a.k.a. Mother Earth, and that he was now working to benefit the cattle ranchers. <laughs> it's important to point that this is not only ridiculous, but, it's, but that as soon as a coup government of Añez came to the office, it passed legislation that allowed the ranchers to extend their lands into forested areas. So it's just a complete fucking farce. I, I think the important thing to know is that, like, you know, the, not to get into the nitty gritty of, like, the Bolivian thing, but it's painting the picture that there is a larger transnational corporate focus on Bolivia and their specific lithium resources here. And I'm just going to skip down to the to the bottom part where it says a world of lithium. In 2019, the benchmark Bloomberg New Energy Finance's Energy Storage Outlook 2019 report anticipated that by 2030, the price of the lithium ion battery would drop dramatically. 
and that, as a consequence, renewable energy, solar and wind, plus storage of energy in batteries would expand exponentially, again, making the lithium, the lithium reserves in Bolivia all the more important. By 2040, there is an expectation that wind and solar will produce 40% of the world energy consumption rather than the 7% it now produces. For this, demand for energy storage will increase. The total demand for batteries from the stationary storage and electric transport sectors is forecast to be 4,500 4, gigawatt hours by 2040. The key component here is that this will provide a major opportunity for miners of component metals such as lithium, cobalt, and nickel. When Bloomberg's analysts use a word like miners, they do not mean Bolivian miners or Congolese miners, but the transnational firms such as Tesla and its chief, Elon Musk. As far as Bloomberg and Añez are concerned, South America is no longer to follow the, na the resource nationalist project of Evo Morales. This is Elon Musk's South America, a place for the neo-conquistadors to make money and leave them behind social carnage. So I know that's uh, it's a lot to go through, but I think what's really important to explain here is that the interconnectedness between, as discussed here, the transnational interests around what is to be a, a burgeoning economy, that even with renewable resources under capitalism versus fossil fuels under capitalism, there are these capitalist vultures that are trying to come in and monetize and brutalize, potentially brutalize and take away the sovereignty of people because of that profit opportunity and because of that opportunity for like the 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 kind of high flying dude that Elon Musk is to be able to have a fucking meeting with the fascist president of of Brazil and to get behind a what could be construed as a coup d'etat of a sovereign nation in uh, Bolivia. And so I thought for for those reasons that term neo conquistador was extremely apt. What's not apt though is that he's from South Africa. And I, can I just point out the city's from is pre, do you say it's Pretoria? Pretoria. Yeah. yeah. That's like a little on the nose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I think the the thing that that um that that whole uh kind of episode highlights too is that in the in the you know quote unquote tech world and the whole like idea of the Silicon Valley utopian shit and I I would really love to do a a much longer like maybe focused episode just on the kind of like ideological component of uh, um, you know the Silicon Valley entrepreneurship and this whole idea of like oh you know we're we're in the future the future is today and all and and, and uh, of which Musk is a obviously a central character in that kind of thing it's always these like very specific almost quasi sci-fi visions of what the future look like and the whole kind of term at least on a like a you know a media engineering th way that they've talked about it like a social media thing or just like the experience that you have through like technological apparatuses via your computer or the internet is always this idea of this like frictionless future right a frictionless future where you can just step into a pod and the pod will tr magically transport you from point a to point b or whatever the fuck the particular articulation is you know you'll you'll put yourself in a tube and you'll be shot through a tunnel in the center of the earth and you know end up on the other side of the earth you know before lunchtime and all these insane ideas that are put out what is never talked about right is that in order to achieve that idea of like frictionlessness which first of all we should question whether or not not that's good but in order to achieve that you need lots of friction in in both your like resource acquisition and then the labor that's that's required to put this shit together it's not just like oh it'll be magic 3d printers that just make things out of thin air you know the 3d printers are manufactured by humans <laughs> yes. in a fucking factory i almost i almost had to one time when i was really desperate for work and i was living in industry city i lived close to the makers the makers factory maker fair you know the the, the Oh, the, you know that company that makes the fucking little like at home 3D printers? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and the job was assembling them on the assembly line, which shows the whole like ridiculous fantasy that it's offering you there. And 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 obviously in the way that you're talking about, Dwight, I mean like all of the components that go into like the new technological gadgets and you know even big uh, technological projects, even things that are like ostensibly good things that we want, like clean energy, right? Like those all require a a mining of very specific minerals which are located in very specific geographical places that have their own like specific political histories especially in relationship to like the west or the united states or whatever and so neo conquistador is is as you say like it's a great it's a very apt phrase i mean neo imperialist whatever like all of these things have to happen so that they can make like a new fucking version of the tesla car you know that then they're, they're gonna break anyway when they show it at the floor show 
show <laughs> like the time they did with the fucking Tesla, the Tesla truck. truck. You know, but you, but you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying, right? Like it, it costs like a real friction in terms of like human blood to get those minerals in order to then create whatever magical technological doodads that they want to then sell to you know other millionaires. And and Shane. To that point, as you just explained, where would he have learned how to exploit a mining operation <laughs> that he ha- uh, that he's not that he's only tangentially aligned with that he's only tangentially uh, associated with? It's the same fucking thing his dad did. Ten years from now, or whatever, fifteen years from now, whatever their kid's name is, the X, Alpha X Twelve, uh, whatever the fuck that <laughs> that that Exelon. kid is going to be walking around with like a bunch of lithium in in their pocket. <laughs> 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 and be like, you know, walk into a Best Buy and be like, I'll sell you these lithium batteries for a hundred dollars or whatever. And then the very next day, Elon Musk will take take their kid and and to the store and be like, see, now it's an Xbox. There will be he will be the vice the the X for uh Susudio, whatever his name is is going to be the vice chancellor to baron trump's you know uh, <laughs> dictator global dictator for life no no but they're both you know what they're both gonna be they're both gonna be the heads of the trade federation <laughs> from the Star Wars prequels, okay? <laughs> and they're going to li- they're going to be on the donut ships and they're going to try to fucking trap Jedi in their in their tea serving room nonsensically that they have. Oh um, man. Yeah, that's that's where they're going to end up. We have to question, like, if 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 we could consider this a coup of like a right wing, you know, business friendly government in Bolivia, and I don't want to get into like the nitty gritty of all that stuff because I'm not as I'm not learned enough to. But there has to be private interests of enormous gravity that push those things to happen, right? And right, I mean, who who funds it? Who funds the coups? Where do they get the fucking money from? They don't just spring up organically, you know. In an interest of uh, an interest of um, let's just say legality, there was an article which i chose to omit which directly alleged his uh financial involvement in that mm-hmm. which i figured wouldn't be prudent for us to do but i highly recommend yeah. that if anybody I, I, i'll just i'll just assert that he paid for it in no part. <laughs> i'll <laughs> no. do it allegedly hilariously <laughs> as a joke shane that's really I, funny I, ha, ha, ha. I personally am staking my <laughs> reputation <No. laughs> on the deep plausibility that he had a direct hand in that i don't see why you guys are afraid of uh elon musk who you know we all know he has very thick skin yeah <laughs> i'll tell you i'll tell you exactly why i can because you tweeted that thing that said hey this uh my my tweet of, with him actually has already ended up in the text of a lawsuit <laughs> yeah that's right oh i forgot to mention that there's so many layers to this that i, I know I'm because it happens so fast so um somebody sent me a dm i didn't know who this person was and he was like whoa dude you're in a lawsuit i'm like what and i click on it and then uh my tweets which is like oh yeah um he had blocked me and i said i said um, uh, I just tweeted a screenshot of the block. I was like, you massive fucking baby. Just, you know, I, again, I didn't think he'd see it. Uh, that tweet went crazy. I can't remember. It just, uh, you know, because a lot of people were still laughing about the uh, picture, uh, replying with the picture and everything. And then after that, he unblocked me and replied <laughs> that actually I was the one who was owned because he blocked people as an insult. <laughs> But now, but no now, now way. that he insulted, now that yeah, that's what he's. You can look at it; it's still up. He said, "He says now that I've insulted you, I can unblock you." And then he, yeah, that was when he sent the picture of you know, one of his fantastic memes. You know, he loves memes. So, um, and this is instructive too. I sent a picture. It was the uh, Ralph Wiggum where he's going like, "I'm help," but it was like, "I'm a journalist." And what I love about that is I, I, I looked through. I was curious. I was like, "Where did he come? Up, why did he come up with this like 15 year old Benny Johnson ass? Like, uh, this is like a Ben Shapiro kind of thing where he figured it out like two decades after everyone." Else. And I go through. He didn't even come up with himself. He took it from one of his fans that tweeted it. Really? And he doesn't credit the fan. Yeah, he sends the picture, doesn't credit the fan. <laughs> oh, that's fucking hilarious. So wait, so um, to, cl- to clarify, you're currently blocked or unblocked? Uh, so after I said, you massive fucking baby, he unblocked me. Damn, I mean, he needs to unblock me. He blocked you. Well, have you tried tweeting, you massive fucking baby? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, you should tweet him, tweet it at him, and be like, "Elon Musk, if you unblock me and send me two thousand dollars, I will send you back four thousand dollars." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'd just be like, you massive fucking cheapskate. I bet you can't send me all your money in Bitcoin. In like <laughs> He's like, I, I only don't send money to people as an insult. <laughs> so here, I got you. I'm also just like struck by the amount of material that I'm just like remembering is happen- has happened with him that we can't possibly get to. Like the fact that he called, remember the- The pedo, the, the, the diver. The pedophile <laughs> yeah. submarine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's just so... Well, they, yeah, they're so enraging. The backdrop of this is, like, you know, very clearly just making this thing up with absolutely zero right. evidence alleging it. About and by the right. way, being one of the most famous people on the planet uh, about not just any guy, but some guy who, like, out of the goodness of his heart, went in and saved these kids after Musk had been, uh, you know, what sure seems like lying about making some preposterous idea of a submarine that was going to go in there and, yeah. and yeah. save them. And then this is the guy that is begging everyone for uh, decency and, and, and decorum on Twitter. Right, yeah, not only... Yeah, not only to 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 do that to you know allege with no evidence being this very famous public figure to you know allege that this you know private citizen is a is a pedophile yourself having these weird connections with like literally the most famous pedophile in, in the world <laughs> like the balls to do that it's incredible. <laughs> He's he's throwing bricks from inside a glass house, but it's in, inexplicably, the glass house is also underground oh. <laughs> and only accessible yeah. by a series of pneumatic tubes. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're bringing this back to me. I'm glad that you mentioned house because uh, this was a, a, a Fox article from like a few months uh, from a month ago or something. It said Elon Musk sells mansion after vow to quote own no house. Oh, he yeah, tweeted I that he was that. going to yeah. sell. Yeah. He was going to yeah. fucking like yeah. d- d- turn into Jesus or something and like dedicate his life to fucking asceticism right. or whatever and sell off all his worldly right. possessions and fucking like roam the earth like fucking he, jewels he, and pulp he fiction fin- he just finished watching pulp fiction yeah, yeah, and saw yeah. jewels <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so jewels yeah. yeah yeah that how long did that how long did that last it like eight hours if that i mean again the f- the fickleness and the weird attempt to be this kind of like again like guru right. spiritual right. cool guy figure like another one was like you know a few years ago when he went on the joe rogan podcast and he smoked a blunt oh, yeah, bro. On, on camera, and w- which the meme comes so from. So cool. And then, like, he got a bunch of blowback from that, <laughs> and apparently, like, the Air Force was going to investigate their, like, contracts with SpaceX or whatever. Oh, God. And so then, in response, he said, I, I forget if it was SpaceX or Tesla, he was like, I'm going to take, I'm thinking about taking them private at a share yep. price of $420. That's right. Which was obviously, again, just like a weed meme meme thing he oh, did yes. that Just again like, what the I, I believe fuck are you doing recently right. I, didn't S- didn't he get in trouble with the sec because yes. yeah. he can't actually yes. like yes. lie yeah. about mislead yes. investors about <laughs> yes uh, just recently and he did another like ago, uh, was, like epic 420 yeah, was a, fucking meme or something he did the tesla pr- stock price too high imo yeah that's, <laughs> i think that's that's uh. that's what it was because that yeah, again that's a, like yeah. that's like the dumb guy thing where he would be like oh man he's so rich but he's so noble that he thinks Thinks that his value right, right. is actually right, a little bit right. too high, so he actually wants it to come down because that's how cool and responsible he is. Mm. And it f- fucking backfired. Well, my favorite, yeah, my favorite part of that were all of his like his legitimate fans like yelling at him and they was like, "What the fuck, Elon? Like, I just, <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. I just lost three thousand dollars." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> What if, or, or, I, I'm just remembering too how he sent uh, the fucking CPAP machines with a Tesla sticker oh, on that's it. That's right. Instead oh, of ventilators God. for COVID. Oh, can you imagine how long how long it would take to just unpack all of his? I mean, that's beyond even hypocrisy because that's offering. It's kind of like offering a cancer patient hope, and you're like, just kidding, or you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's yeah. like so crazy. Like, how do you even <laughs> sleep at night? Christ. And it's it's right. in the middle of this pandemic that everyone's terrified. You know of what's Christ? Yeah, I remember. I totally forgot about that. Can you imagine the man hours of essential workers that had to go to being like investigating exactly what they were that arrived at the loading docks and having to like explain up the chain to like of the hospital to be like well actually sir you know we've we've identified the make and model and uh th- this is consistent with what we found from a company that actually makes CPAP machines we think that this is like how much wasted fucking time s- spent right. on this just because he wanted a a, a, a a little bit of a PR giggle mm-hmm. what a fucking joke I mean that's 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 again to speak to the to the true lack of genius or whatever you know that that 
that he purportedly is attempting to like claim that he has or whatever. What what that really means is he has so much money and so much power over the people around him is that he can just sit on his ass and come up with stupid shit and then people have to indulge him in it. He has to say something like, you know, what if... Uh, like, what if we made a, a, a yacht in the shape of a banana? What would that look like? And that mean, that they then takes, like, huge amounts of manpower and hours and shit for somebody to put together the plan and then present it to him and be like, I I'm sorry, sir, if we were to do this, it would sink immediately. And and he, you know, he goes, like, let's build it anyway, or whatever. Like, it's, it's, it's the g level of genius that, like, a king has. He's just a petty little king who can command his minions to do X, Y, Z for whatever and most of the ideas suck and maybe the few that take off or have some scientific validity he then just stamps his name on and then he does like a fucking ted talk presentation of it and he lets like look i invented this yeah i came up with the idea of solar energy oh god because <laughs> he doesn't produce anything he, engineers no. do workers produce goods billionaires do not produce right. goods i will blame him directly though for sent i'm sorry, this is just one last thing that i can't get out of my mind was when he sent the roads the tesla roadster into space towards mars but oh. nasa had mm -hmm. to say that it was never sterilized so he mm -hmm. may be sending a, a an earth bacteria bomb to mars mm -hmm. and might terraform mars with just disease and just the worst shit in the world. Look it up. Mm -hmm. Look at I just uh, he. It was the largest single contamination of space ever. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard of this. Oh, oh. This seems like dumb enough to uh, be like a life origin on an extraterrestrial planet story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then there's Xenogenesis. like new life form that's like worshiping their their creator god, which is like the <laughs> South African uh, <laughs> magnate. <laughs> I, look, there's there's obviously just too much shit to uh there's too, too much shit to go into yeah. we should we should bring we could, we, it to a close. In, in six months he'll have another meltdown he'll attack he'll listen to this he'll attack us he'll attack oh Ken, god i hope so and he'll also he'll invent some no, new kind of it, parachute that's a hat and we'll be able to do a follow-up <laughs> on him that was a that was a little reference to the great dictator folks charlie chaplin class oh, oh lovely if i was smart i might know that um <laughs> ken thank you for joining us man i really really appreciate you coming on to talk about this absolute horse shit happy to talk about absolute horse shit. <laughs> it's, it's just it's so yeah. fucking insane to me like it, it was it was one easily one of my favorite days online was that was uh was that was july 4th right yep that's right Jesus. um and that was one year to that was exactly yep. one year after uh steve king yep. <laughs> replied to I, my my request that he uh shout out my what was it my uncle nathan uh jessup who's uh you know serving our country overseas and can't enjoy can't enjoy a hot dog and a drink with us out here so today. good dude so good. <laughs> what, what a picture of jack nicholson who doesn't know who jack nicholson is he's the white nationalist guy who's like you need to be american he doesn't understand like the cornerstone nicholson. of american culture that is exactly <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I, I cannot I, I, i've been thinking about this for a fucking year now i cannot like what kind of fucking sicko pervert is steve king like what has he been doing with his life for the past fucking 50 years if he doesn't oh, if he doesn't what? recognize he's, literally he's like the most maybe the most recognizable actor of the past half century like how does he not know who this is? He doesn't watch movies. What does he do? No, he's such a francophile that he just doesn't have time for the um, North American. <laughs> so, you know, he's just uh, enjoying all these uh, European films. Right. He doesn't have time for yeah, that. that's him. Uh, I pulled the wool over Steve King's eyes too. Remember that? He fell yeah, for my you fucking uh, Muller Dad sixty nine, bro. The, yeah. Oh, that was. Oh, yeah, that's right. I he totally fell for the Starbucks tweet. Yeah. <laughs> I stand on the shoulder of giants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ken, thank you again. Tell tell the people uh, where we can find you and what you have going on. Um, I'm on Twitter at Ken Klippenstein. And uh, if you're a Fed, and you guys would be surprised how many of these uh, listen to different shows, oh, uh, hit me up uh, on Signal. It's an encrypted uh, texting app. Just send me a text message at 202-510-1268. Especially if you're law enforcement or intelligence, uh, you all are always quite helpful. Awesome. I'll text you later when I'm having trouble falling asleep. You have a very, very nice voice. <laughs> Ken's, Ken's got two phones. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, God. All right. I'm going to look up some more Elon Musk bullshit, and then I'll maybe that'll help me fall asleep. <laughs> Ken, thank you very much for coming on again. Appreciate it, Of man. course. Thank you. Really nice seeing you guys. All right. Take care, Be well, friends. All right. Take care, everyone. See you Stay in the cool. Stay cool. Yeah. <laughs> See you in five minutes. <laughs> Some minimum wage, he don't need the bus. Start your car with the fog, keys are bust. Want some 
something larger, you should see our truck. If you're bored, there's more than four wheels on Musk. Cop on his rocket if you want to feel that Elon thrust. Blood, sweat, and tears. Call that Elon's Musk. Yo, let's carve a marble sculpture of Elon's bus. More of a model entrepreneur than Steve Drop Plus. Self taught in rocket science far beyond us. Forget the energy crisis, he can recharge us. Make it sustainable. One day we all must. He's on a Star Trek. Scotty Beam on now. But what's the deal with Neil Armstrong? He loves touch. For when our planet is long gone yeah. Sorry, your argument has weak legs are strong Musk get the future, you know it's true You'll never bring him down, he's so over the moon Real talk, what planet is Neil on? No clue, but you can thank Elon On the wings of the Falcon We'll be traveling through the stars With the fire of the dragon I'm talking ozone. You're in his house now. Wipe off your toes, bro. Carbon footprints are a no-no. The oil companies are gassed out.